I'll tell you what. I mean, I think it's so ludicrous and so frivolous and so mindless that it'll take that it has merit. <laughs> <laughs> gold, gold, gold. <laughs> Welcome to the Shark Tank podcast. Each week, one of the best entrepreneurs from ABC's network smash hit Shark Tank teaches you how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, T.J. Hale. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Shark Tank Podcast. My guest today is none other than Mark Peterson, who you probably remember after he signed a deal, or shook on a deal rather, with Robert Herjavec for $60,000 in exchange for 25% of the Gold Rush Nugget Bucket. Mark, how's it going? Fantastic, DJ. Thanks for having me on. Welcome to the show. It's a joy to have you, a thrill to have you. And one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on, aside from the fact that my wife thought you had like the absolute coolest product of all time, was uh, <laughs> that you shook on a deal with Robert. You guys closed it. It's advertised on your website. And uh, I just I haven't had anyone who did a deal with Robert on a long time. So I want to catch up, see how things are going, and see how the business has blown up since uh, since your Shark Tank airing. So yeah. what's, the, what's the latest? What's some of the highlights since you aired? Oh boy, you know, it's, uh, uh, the shark tank effect is live and well, uh, can't complain about that. Um, it's been, uh, one year actually, February 13th, uh, since we aired and, um, probably the, uh, the main accomplishment, uh, a couple of them, I suppose I hired a, a digital marketing manager, uh, that, uh, was needed to, you know, uh, master the digital world and, uh, online sales. And then here recently, we just got our first PO to uh, Sportsman's Warehouse. So we are going to be in 60 of their 71 stores starting in March. Cool, cool. All right. So let's touch on that a little bit. And I've, I've actually gotten emails recently. This has probably been a recurring theme in my show that sometimes people can't remember uh, which entrepreneur I'm talking to because they watch so much Shark Tank. So just to take them back a little bit, you've got a bucket that looks kind of like a standard five gallon. Sorry if that's offensive. I know it's not a standard bucket. It's but a lot of Five gallon bucket. So I can take the bucket, I can dump in some earth or soil, and the bucket will essentially sift out the gold for me automatically. So of course, my first thought as an entrepreneur is I should have thousands of these things lining the beach in Alaska and just have this gold assembly line on the shores of the Alaskan coast uh, and then retire up there. Would that work? <laughs> uh, we sell an awful lot of them to Alaska, that's for sure. Um, but yes, uh, what it is, um, it's a, uh, complete gold panning kit self-contained into a five gallon bucket, uh, weighs seven pounds. It's easy to carry, easy to store, throw it in the back of your trunk, off you go. Uh, but the proprietary aspect of it is once it's unpacked and then it's re, uh, configured, what you have is two screens that sit above a funnel and the uh, two screens obviously catch the larger uh, nuggets, hopefully, and uh, cool rocks and gems and artifacts and such like that. But the, uh, the, the material that flows through the funnel uh, and into a bowl is calibrated such that uh, the gold dust, which is the most common form of gold that's out there, it's also the hardest to recover, uh, is um, thrust through the funnel and uh, dropped into this bowl where the column of water, which contains the gold, uh, penetrates a bed of sand and then is trapped at the bottom layer of the sand. And uh, we've now accomplished uh, close to 99% of the recovery of uh, the super fine gold. And that's what makes the, the nugget bucket uh, special. Uh, not just that it's completely self-contained into an easy to carry kit but we're actually capturing and concentrating the hardest form of gold to find into one small bowl so that when you do pan, you're just dumping in super concentrated material into a pan and you see results and get excited. And, and um, we have both uh, professional and seasoned prospectors that are using it. And uh, the bigger market is obviously a family oriented activity where uh, kids can participate uh, equally in it in that they can just scoop in dirt, pour in water until their heart's content. 
and then um, you can physically see the gold in the bottom of the bowl, uh, which makes it exciting for everybody. I feel like I asked my car mechanic how a catalytic converter works, when really I just like the magic is more fun. I just knowing that it goes in dirty and comes out clean, right? So you right. you figured that out. These yeah. advanced prospectors, aren't they kind of looking at you with that snide look in their eye? Like, who is this guy? This guy's he thinks he can prospect with the real. We're the real deal. Why didn't they think of this? You know, it's a uh, it's. Um, you know, most of the physics involved is uh, utilized in a lot of different equipment already. <clears throat> we just consolidated it and put it into a, uh, a form that's easy to use. And uh, so, yeah, initially, a lot of prospectors uh, pushed back against it because it was too simple of an idea. It's all plastic. How could it really work? But on our website, we show a video of, of the gold ring forming in the bottom of the bowl. We actually had a camera shot from up, under, up underneath the bucket showing the gold dust forming in the bottom of it. And that's just proof positive. And so um, we have a lot of uh, pr prospectors that are buying it uh, a lot in California, uh, for instance, where they've had uh, drought and the rivers are no longer flowing, and, but there's still pools of water. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity to take the nugget bucket into these areas. Uh, they can access uh, virgin riverbed and have pools of water right there. And they're, um, they're able to uh, um, collect uh, and find uh, gold that they would otherwise not be able to use in traditional methods, like a sluice box requires running water. Well, if the if the river or the stream is no longer flowing due to the uh, the drought conditions, uh, then the the typical sluice box that is used by prospectors just isn't going to work. Like you, you need that flow, right? You need that flow. And then what's, uh, uh, what is working to our advantage, unfortunately, is also a lot of regulation that is um, uh, banning uh, mechanical or motorized equipment in a lot of areas for the protection of the waterways. And so a lot of areas now are just designated gold panning only, and our kit satisfies that. And so uh, from that perspective, uh, prospectors, uh, uh, seasoned professionals are using it. Um, but uh, like I said, the, uh, uh, you know, the bigger market that we're really trying to tap into is the family and the kids. And this gets them started. And it's a great family activity. And then a lot of times people will advance beyond the nugget bucket and then buy uh, bigger and more expensive equipment. Turn this down a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's really interesting. Now, I want to talk about your background. I mean, everyone on Shark Tank has a story, right? They all got started somewhere. So you're talking about the physics of this. When did you decide, I'm going to take the magic of panning for gold and I'm going to put it in a self-contained bucket? Like, what was your light bulb moment? Yep, light bulb moment was uh, in March of 2011. Uh, we were literally watching the Gold Rush television show with my two daughters. Uh, it was a nice sunny day in March here in Oregon, which you yeah, got to take those uh, when you get them. And uh, I asked the girls if they wanted to go out and uh, find some gold. And, of course, the allure of finding gold is always uh, high with everybody. And uh, we um, uh, went out with a five-gallon bucket and a couple screens that fit on top of the bucket. And I drilled a hole towards the bottom of the bucket so that the water can drain out. And the light bulb uh, went off when I saw my two daughters, uh, who had never done this before, uh, played for about two hours uh, finding what was in the dirt after the water was poured in. So they found rocks and polished glass and things like this. And then the key aspect of it was when I was uh, we were preparing to go home and I was taking the bucket apart, um, because I drilled the hole about an inch and a half, two inches above the bottom, all of the lighter stuff flowed out of the hole but left the heavier stuff. And a lot of that heavier stuff was black sand. And for uh, gold prospectors, they know that if you're concentrating and finding black sand, well, black sand is the next heaviest thing to gold. And so if there was any gold in that dirt, which there wasn't because we were just at a local river, then um, then whatever you're doing was going to work in terms of finding gold. And so when I saw all that black sand left in the bottom of the bucket, um, the wheel started turning and I started thinking about, well, you know, there's nothing else. There's nothing exists out there that's an all in one, easy to carry compact kit. And if it could be just something where, you know, you just scoop in dirt and pour in water and uh, concentrate it, uh, then that would be a commercially viable product. And uh, so I started working on it and um, thinking about it and putting it together and made a lot of prototypes. All right. So at this point, 
Um, take me through the process. How long were you selling the product before you decided to go on Shark Tank or were contacted by them? And uh, I know that it, I think when you went on in your airing, you said that you had sold about $290,000 worth of product in 17 months, which you know, kind of got the shark's attention a little bit. So what, you know, how did you generate that in 17 months? It's a pretty decent haul for a brand new startup prototype based business. It is. And, uh, you know, what we tapped into was uh, undoubtedly the gold prospecting community per se itself uh, generated, uh, you know, that those kinds of sales. Uh, and because uh, it was a new piece of equipment, uh, it, you know, we were showing that it was uh, doing something that a lot of other equipment wasn't doing, you know, uh, but, uh, by collecting that uh, that gold dust the way it was. And um, with the, uh, the droughts in California and elsewhere and the uh, regulations preventing uh, anything but gold pan kits in certain areas, uh, we were able to um, uh, fill a niche uh, with, re, you know, inside the gold prospecting community. And so um, that was uh, probably the main reason why we had such good sales right out of the gate. And then you had also, so there was a lot of things that were left out of the segment. Like they didn't say what the cost to produce was. You didn't talk about your projections. You didn't really say much of anything outside of that initial negotiation. I imagine that was discussed, but that wasn't part of the on-air narrative. Right. So the one comment that did come out is that you invested $192,000 primarily in mold. So for anyone out there who has a molded product, you know, it's kind of the chicken before the egg. Like you believe in the product, but you know, it's going to cost you 150 grand to get it produced. Had, were you selling homemade prototypes or did you invest the money on a whim or on a leap of faith, knowing that you could get people to buy it? Leap of faith. You know, I just believed in it so much because there just was not anything out there that, um, you know, that, uh, was going to do what this was going to do. And, uh, um, I just, uh, I did a lot of research, um, um, a lot of thought. Um, I, uh, figured out what the cost, uh, to produce it was going to be. I figured out what the, uh, a realistic price point uh, would be and saw that, uh, uh those two were going to work. Um, and I would have the margins that we would have, that, uh, you know, that we would, we would need. And, um, so basically it was a leap of faith. Yeah. And then how did you get on Shark Tank? Where, where did that, was that always kind of in the back of your head or did you just lightning strike one day? I'm going on Shark Tank. No, it was uh, my CPA actually told me, uh, he said, Mark, you know, you got to go on Shark Tank. And I said, what is that? Because I hadn't heard of it. And uh, that was in uh, October of two, uh, 2013. And so I literally just sent off an email to um, uh, auditions at uh, like Shark, Shark Tank auditions at gmail.com, believe it or not. And so, um, you know, it was kind of one of those things where if you're not fishing, Shark Tank casting at Yahoo, I think, but just oh, just so people yeah. don't get confused. <laughs> so, uh, liar. Uh, I just figured that uh, you know, if you're not fishing, you can't catch any fish. I'll just throw that line out in the water and then uh, let it sit. And then, um, so that's all I did is I took a, a selfie uh, and a little uh, write up about it and emailed it off. And uh, in March of 2014, um, I was sitting. Uh, reading through my emails, and all of a sudden, um, uh, a casting producer from Shark Tank emailed me and said, uh, Mark, we'd like to talk to you. And, so and one email, five months later. One email, five months later, and I, it was out of sight, out of mind for me at that point in time. And I was just enjoying watching the show at that point. It's and, funny because like the nerd waxes and the savvy naturals of the world, they're sending like one email a week for three months or five months, yeah. and then they finally get a response. You're kind of just throwing one line out there, a little bobber one line and forgot about it and then got a hook on it. So good for um, you. Good for I think it, I think probably, you know, looking back, it's probably, you know, it's, it's a unique enough product that from a production standpoint and a viewer perspective, it, you know, it was probably um, a, kind of a standout type of product amongst all of the energy bars and stuff like that that are on there. So when you're in Shark Tank, um, did any? Bef I, I kind of want to get to the negotiation, but before I do, I don't want to totally gloss over the audition process because auditions are coming up for season eight uh, in March. So I know a lot of people are amped up about you know what maybe you would do differently. Did you make take any mulligans? Is there anything that stood out from the experience in a good or bad way? In terms of the auditions? In terms of the process of the email gets responded to, you start talking to your producer until you're actually filming your segment with the sharks. You know, they, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. I would, obviously I wouldn't do anything different because I was able to get on. 
Uh, so got a kiddo in the background. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hear? Yeah, my son just came in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'd really do anything different because obviously I was able to get onto the show. Um, but looking back, you know, what proved to be successful was um, understanding that uh, what they were looking for is entertainment and um, and uh, show worthy types of answers to their questions and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, legitimately and uh, realistically, I was willing to, you know, make a deal and give a percentage of the company away. And, and that's one thing that uh, they want. You know, they're not looking for the people just to get on the show and have some fame and then get the publicity and that's right. not, right. not cut deals because that doesn't uh, work long term for the show. So uh, you have to be really, truly willing to uh, be, if you do get in there to, to cut a deal. Um, and if you say you're not really going to, then you probably won't get on. So what was your strategy? I mean, we know what happened now, but going in, um, were you looking to, okay. And obviously you did a deal with Robert, but what I felt was interesting about yours is every single person in your deal went out essentially, except for Kevin and then Robert jumped back in. You hardly ever see that. And I had forgotten when we started talking that that happened to you because I can count on one hand how many times that's happened. So, Mm -hmm. uh, was Robert your goal going in or you just want like a fair deal and someone who can make something happen for you? You know, I did my research on the sharks and Robert, uh, you know, has a history of investing in outdoor and fun, um, uh, products. And so, I thought he would be a good uh, a good fit for us, and uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, they all started going out really quick. Mark Cuban being the first, and uh, I thought, oh boy, this is it. You know, I'm going to be one of those laughing products that's on Shark Tank. You started but, sweating into your bucket, huh? <laughs> very much fun. so. But I think you know it's a product that on the surface um, uh, it, it's misunderstood as to the to the layperson as to what it is and really how big the market is out there. One of the questions uh, in the interview process, uh, Kevin asked me uh, if uh, if there's gold panning equipment in any of the big box stores. And to his and all of their surprise, when I told him, absolutely, you know, in, in Cabela's and Bass Pro and Sportsman's Warehouse, all the way down the line, uh, they have gold panning equipment. And uh, uh, I don't remember if uh, I, I'm assuming I had that conversation before Robert came back in. But uh, it took me some explaining about the market size and the product. Uh, and then I, I think that's how you know, Robert decided to come back in. Yeah. But and, uh, oh, state, go ahead. But on the surface, you know, it just, it, uh, like Robert, like, uh, like Kevin said, you know, it's such a mindless type of product that it might have merit. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to play that clip in the lead up to the show. It was so funny. Like this product is X, Y, Z, and uh, D. And that's why it might work. So it's kind yeah. of a backhanded compliment, but yeah, he's, he's right in a way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it might just have merit. Now, Mark said, yeah, it's a cool idea, but not the kind of gold that I pan for. I'm out. So in the TV, he was the first one. Robert Herjavec, very cool. I'm out. Barbara Corcoran, I think I should buy one for my husband, Bill. I'm out. Kevin O'Leary, do you want to go into retail? So this is kind of the first serious probing question you got after three sharks are out. So I can see why you were nervous. But what else about the market and the product were discussed? Because you had decent sales. I mean, any company that starts up, and even though you'd spent 192000 you had 290 k in 18 months. That's a pretty good haul. So what, right. what is the, what's the shark missing who can't see the opportunity? Is it just that they're in Cabela's and Bass and they don't know it? Or is there a larger commercial um play involved here to sell these things in bulk and scale the company? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, they, uh, they didn't realize that there is gold panning equipment in, in most big box out, outdoor stores. And so and, uh, let me stop you, Mark, is a competitor kind of in the same, uh, same niche, but what's the price range? Are they selling like a $20 kit, a $200 kit, or is it same as yours around a hundred bucks? Yeah, no, a real, a real basic gold panning kit can be, you know, 20 or $30. And that's just a couple of screens and a gold pan. Um, but for anybody but somebody who knows what they're doing, um, that product isn't going to work for them or last very long. It's certainly not going to help a kid um, uh, or somebody with bad knees or a bad back. I'm picturing the oversized plate and like a little metal grate they can dump it over, right? The kind of stuff I used to do as a kid, which was right. Yeah, pointless. And so you really have uh, there was, and that was one of the reasons why I, I took a leap of faith is because you have uh, the basic twenty or thirty dollar gold panning kit. And then there's nothing in between. And then the next step up is, you know, probably 
uh, $150 sluice box, um, which is just a metal um, <clears throat> a, a metal uh, piece of equipment that you put into a river and you let the water run down it and you just scoop in dirt and, and stuff is going to get caught in the uh, in the uh, the ripples in such like that. And so there was uh, in, in part of my research, I realized <clears throat> there's nothing in between basically a $30 gold panning kit and a $150 or $200 uh, professional piece of equipment. And so um, it was because of that void there that I realized that, you know, that uh, this was a leap of faith yet. Um, I think, you know, it was pretty reasonable that they would sell. So you air on Shark Tank, you get your deal with Robert. Oh, I'm sorry, let me and finish the negotiation. Kevin actually gave you an offer for 60000 for 50% of the company. Robert said, the longer you stand there, the more I like you. My wife said something similar, and our marriage worked out pretty good. So I actually think that was a nice compliment. Uh, yeah. And then he said, you know what, I'll give you sixty k for 25%. What I thought was really, really funny, and maybe not so funny for Robert, was uh, the other shark started calling him out. And talking yeah. about how he's actually going to have to work because you asked him about his value proposition. I don't remember the exact wording of your question. Say, Robert, what are you going to bring to the table? What's your vision for this? And they started heckling him saying, Robert, you're going to have to go to work. And he got up and carried it around like it was a briefcase. Hi, Cabela's. Hi, Bass Pro. But it was a good question. What are you going to do for me? Yeah. Uh, you know, the vision. Um and uh, I had planned on asking that question uh, if I was, if I had the opportunity to get an offer, because I really did want to know that, you know, is there vision for big box stores? Is there vision uh, just uh, uh, domestically or internationally? You know, in my opinion, if if um, an angel uh, shark investor is going to invest in a product, they probably have some ideas uh, already baking in the back of their mind about how they're going to get this thing out there and, and make some money. And so um, I wanted to know legitimately what his uh, vision was uh, behind making the offer. And it, uh, it part of the reason why my segment did get shown on Shark Tank is because that turned into a very entertaining uh, moment where um, uh, I think it was uh, Kevin started poking fun at Robert and saying, Hey, you're going to go around to the stores. It was pretty funny. One by one. And so, yeah, that's uh that was probably one of the reasons why they, they picked my yeah, He looked like Ray Kroc with his milkshake machine, right? And no, no. who's next? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then they did the whole Kevin O'Leary bucket. They played that shot at the end. That was after you walked out. So I don't know if you saw that or if they had staged that previously, but they put Kevin's face on the bucket. And I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, that uh, I did. I had no knowledge of that until I watched the, the episode myself. And so uh, that turned out pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That's one of those gimmicks you'd almost want to use before you get there where everyone has a bucket with their face on it or something. But I thought that yeah. was pretty hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so you agree to the deal with Robert. You guys shake hands. Your partners now. Tell me about the process from walking out of the Shark Tank to your airing. Uh, the amount of interaction. Tell me about how long it takes to get the deal done. And tell me the strategy and the alignment of vision for you guys to have a successful airing and uh, kind of capture as many sales as you can from the event. Well, the uh, obviously there is uh, negotiations and the and what's called due diligence um, after you walk out of the tank and shaking on a on a, a verbal deal, and um, they go through uh, all of the numbers that I had cited during the uh, my presentation, and they do all of their um, investigation into the validity of the patents and these kinds of things and. Um, I actually went in there and uh, I had underquoted my numbers so that um, uh, if I was in a position where I had shook on a deal and then the due diligence uh, process was to begin, that they would actually be pleasantly surprised that I had underquoted all of my numbers. Smart. And what I mean by that is is that you know we sell the bucket for a hundred dollars and then there's twenty twenty dollars of shipping to the east coast. Let's just say so uh, the you know the uh, the total revenue for that particular sale was $120. But in terms of um, the, the product sales, it's $100. And so I actually quoted product sales and um, as opposed to the uh, product sales plus all the shipping that we collected. And um, So not to have them find out later that 20% of your sales are actually in shipping costs, which yeah, would be a so downer. I they go into, you know, the due diligence, uh, think, you know, um, understanding that the total revenue is going to uh, many a times um, 
include, you know, what we would otherwise be collecting and shipping and then turn around and having that expense. So it's not really a true uh, product sales representation. And so I went in there quoting just the product sales. And and uh, then when they saw the books, they saw that the total revenue was 20% higher than that as opposed to 20% lower. And so you close your deal, and what's the strategy? What the alignment of vision you referred to earlier? What does Robert say is the way forward for the company versus maybe what you had assumed before? You kind of what, what's that conversation sound like? You know, I've, I've had uh, um, one uh, sit down meeting with Robert. It was a great, great meeting, and and he truly, like I believe the rest of the sharks are, you know, are are truly into helping, uh, you know. The, the entrepreneur and the business because uh, it was heartfelt and the information that he gave me was solid. And um, the takeaways from that was that we definitely need to get into big box stores. Um, we need to get into the international market uh, because, you know, a product like this um, just doesn't have, it's not a household item for everybody. And so in order to, to really have the uh, kind of, um, Profits that we would like to see, you know, we definitely need to you know, get into the international markets. Um, and so, uh, and then probably, you know, one of the concerns I had was cannibalizing my own sales um, by selling wholesale to some of these small mom and pop shops. And uh, he was able to give me some really good advice as to uh, the fact that if I sell wholesale uh, to these small mom and pop shops, you know, they're um, they're really going to be just selling out of their brick and mortar and on their website to venues that I'm not able to, to access. And so um, we started a wholesale um, program to do exactly that now. And so, um, yeah, so really the vision is, you know, international and big box stores is uh, really where this kind of product needs to be seen and then uh, thought about and purchased either from the big box store or later at our website. The wholesale question is interesting. And I know when I talk to clients, that's always a concern, but you think not only are you going to have these additional outlets to sell it, you're going to sell more product for less margin. They're typically, in your case, specialty stores, and it's going to cause you more, it's going to extract more resources from you personally. It's more time invested. You have to track it and manage it. So it's not always the most optimal thing. What I mean, are you seeing like a straight Pareto principle of 80-20 with these wholesalers or do you get pretty good return? Has it been worth the investment of time and money to sell through wholesalers? It is. There's still profit there. <clears throat> um, you know, the, there, the bigger concept um, that I didn't understand until having meetings and discussions with Robert and his group is that they call it the halo effect where the more product that you have out there just generates more opportunity. There's more word of mouth. Um so somebody who buys it from one of our um, retailers on, from a wholesale basis, uh, somebody sees that product and then buys it off of our website. Right. <clears throat> so it's that halo effect that is really important when when talking about uh, selling on a wholesale basis. And then were you already in, I don't recall if they mentioned on Shark Tank, were you already in any retail locations? I know you said you locked up Sportsman's after the fact. Was that your first one? That's the first. Uh, that's the first, first major. major. Yeah, we uh, we were not in any stores. Uh, it was 100% online sales uh, prior to going into sh uh, Shark Tank. Um, and then uh, there's a um, uh, a treasure metal detecting company by the name of Kelly Co. Metal Detectors out of Florida that uh, um, had actually bought uh, several small orders from us. I think like 30 at a time, and they're still selling them as well. And so. Um, and they're like a Fortune 4000 company. So uh, we kind of cut our teeth uh, with them and uh, got some things worked out with them and, and learned with them. And then um, and then Sportsman's Warehouse actually contacted us. That was my next question because I want to know why you hadn't already talked to them. And, and everyone listening, almost everyone, is interested in how to get more retail exposure. So let's spend some time talking about how this happened. Well, so um, I hadn't really pursued um, – calling on big box stores until I wanted to make sure my product was perfected because it's a one shot opportunity. And, um, you know, if you sell to a big box store and they don't reorder, that's the kiss of death because when you knock on the next big box store and you tell them, yeah, you know, so-and-so ordered the very first question that they're going to ask is, did they reorder? Yeah. It's like dating. It's like dating your ex-girlfriend's friends. It's just dangerous. Yeah. yeah it's just awkward. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, 
And and if they don't reorder, then the other company you just start calling on is going to say, well, why why would it be any different for us if if that big outdoor store didn't place a reorder? Then why would it you know why would they why would we think to reorder you know make a reorder as well? So um, I wanted to uh, procure the patent, the IP. I wanted to perfect the product, get more feedback from people out in the field, and we've actually uh, tweaked our product. Uh, you know, six or seven times uh, with the molds uh, to get it uh, just perfect, in my opinion, so that um, uh, when we do go into these big box stores, not only um, do we have uh, the best chance of them reordering, but then also, you know, the uh, buyback um, and the returns uh, will be minimized uh, as well. So you definitely want to, you know, get into big box stores when everything is as good as it could possibly get. But you don't want to let perfection, you know, get in the way of good in terms of you know, calling on big box stores either. Yeah, I tell everyone, look, make the call, get get on their radar, make sure you're building relationships. But when you're actually doing business with them, you've got to worry about, you know, your shipping rating, your cost and distribution, your pricing, all those issues that can give them a bad taste in their mouth. Like you've got to kind of be on top of all of them or at least know what you're doing. Yeah. So um, tell me about the way forward. So you got Sportsman's. Are you talking to Cabela's? Are you talking to Bass? Are you talking to Walmart? Like, where's the next big opportunity for you? We're going to wait until, uh, so it's going to, Sportsman's Warehouse, we'll put them on their shelves in March, I think is the plan. And um, once they place that reorder, then um, we have the green light to start making a lot of calls to the other big box stores. Uh, because um, if we were to make that call now, I think the first, you know, the first question that, Cabela's or Bass Pro would say, well, did Sportsman's Warehouse reorder? And I would say, well, we, they haven't yet. And else they'd probably just say, well, if they do, call us back. And if they don't, don't bother. So I'm going to wait until uh, Sportsman's Warehouse uh, places a reorder. And then with that in hand, uh, I'll have a, the deck stacked pretty good in my favor in terms of negotiating with another big box store. How long, what's the time frame until you uh, suspect you'll get a reorder? How much product <laughs> in hand do they have? Yeah, so we sent them 120, uh, two for each store. It's not going to last long because uh, 120 our, total quantity. You're talking about cases. No, 100, 120 total. Okay. Uh, and um, at, with two in each store, um, it's it won't last long. So the um, the uh, potential for reorder is probably within 30 days, in my opinion, of them putting them um, on their shelves. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. Are they keeping the same uh, price that you have online? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Nine nine dollars. Mark it up a little bit uh, going up into Alaska because the cost for them to to uh, ship their inventory up to Alaska is a little bit more expensive. So I suspect uh, you know it'll be a little bit more add on for Alaska, but uh, um, in the lower forty eight, um, their price is going to be the ninety nine ninety five. It's the same as we have on our website. Cause that's kind of the way you know they want it to work, and you know we don't want one another undercutting each other. Yeah, stuff but up. you still have to pay shipping on the site now. So if so. Picking up in store is advantageous for the customer. If they don't want to pay shipping. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So they'll get it for ninety nine ninety five through the store as opposed to one hundred and ten, fifteen, twenty through us. Yeah, the pretty- retailer like that. What about Amazon? You saw on Amazon? We do actually. We saw a lot on Amazon. In fact, um, <clears throat> Amazon has a brand new program that's called uh, um, Amazon Exclusives, and uh, it has to be a separate SKU. And um, and and we've talked to them. Um, the guy that was on Shark Tank, uh, Stephen Arstall, Tower, yeah, Tower Paddle Boards. Yep. He was just on Beyond the Tank, and uh, that was what they talked about was the Amazon exclusives. In fact, it was me watching that episode. Uh, I talked to my digital marketing manager, and uh, he called up there. In fact, what I did is uh, with my iPhone, I took a picture of the three people who he met with. Uh, during his interview and I sent those photos to my digital marketing manager. I said, Hey, here's this guy and his name on there. Why don't you look it up? My digital marketing manager uh, works uh, remotely for me and he lives in Seattle. So he called up the guy that we saw on TV um, and uh, started the discussions. And uh, uh, because we were on shark tank uh, as well, um, they went ahead and um, um, want to move forward with us as well as an exclusive product. And so, uh, gee, that's a huge opportunity. Huge opportunity. It's really funny because I called Stephen and said, "Hey, man, I haven't talked to you for a while. I'm writing an article for Entrepreneur.com about best practices 
on Amazon from Shark Tank people because Amazon's just the boss now, right? They've got more reach than even Walmart does. And he said, hey, I wish I could, but my Beyond the Tank's going to air pretty soon. And it's basically all about Amazon, so I can't give you the secret sauce. So kind of right. kind of shot my a hole through my uh, proposal. But anyway, I might go back to him and see if he can add a little bit now that it's aired. But I thought it was a great segment. I'm really excited about that. Yep, definitely. So we're looking forward to that as well because, um, you know, that program um, – you know, Amazon really pushes your product and gets it out there and does a lot of proprietary things that uh, they, they haven't even told us, which just results in a ton of sales. And so we're looking we're looking forward to that. They do take, as as they told uh, uh, Stephen, they, they do take 5% more of a uh, in their fee. But in exchange for the kind of product they're going to push, you know, it wasn't a no brainer. Talk about hiring your digital marketing manager. How many employees do you have working for you now? We have uh, um, a shipping manager who handles all the incoming uh, orders and boxes them up and ships them out. And that happens to be my brother. And uh, another gentleman who uh, uh, puts samples all the kits together here in the warehouse, uh, all these kits behind us. And then um, uh, that's the warehouse uh, part of it. And then um, David um, is my digital marketing manager and he lives up in Seattle. I think that when newer entrepreneurs or business owners are growing, they get really nervous about, I mean, you can hire for things that you understand really well, you know how to do, um, you know, uh, no disrespect against a shipping manager or people doing customer service. But when you kind of get into the digital marketing aspect, it gets scary, right? Because you're hiring, you're hiring an employee, you're hiring a consultant that's going to teach you a tier type skills. So, uh, what was your vetting process? What, how did you determine who to hire, what you needed? Did you just like put out an application, let 10 guys come and pitch you and then decide which one you liked the best? What, what was your strategy? You know, that's a great question. Um, David, uh, be- long before Shark Tank, he was working for a company, and um, I was paying that company for them to provide some um, SEO uh, type of uh, stuff for me because all of that stuff is beyond my pay grade. And then uh, he had since quit that company, moved to Seattle, and then he saw me on Shark Tank, and he called me up. And, and he's 26 years old. He's a millennial. So that was number one criteria. He's a young and, yeah, gun. I, and I really enjoyed working with him in the past. And uh, he actually literally, um, before I gave him a commitment, quit his full-time job in Seattle. That's how much he wanted the job. And, uh, and he knew so much, um, about the digital world that, um, you know, uh, in my mind, I justified it as if gold rush nugget bucket can't earn enough extra revenue from having a full-time person manage Amazon and eBay and the website and in the whole online world, then it's just not going to revenue enough overall to be worth it. And so um, I decided to bring him on board, and um, he's been very instrumental in us mastering the digital place. Yeah, I think it's key. It's always a hard thing for entrepreneurs to pull the trigger on that, but they have to think of it in terms of, and I have this conversation a lot, think in terms of the value. If it costs you 40 grand, 50 grand, or 100 grand, if that person does the work and makes you a 1,000, 100 grand and one dollar, and you're learning the trade and you're making progress, then it's the investment's worth it, in my opinion. Absolutely. Because you have to do it. You know, for several reasons, you know, obviously with a single product company, you have to, you know, master and own the digital world and in order to drive direct sales. What I, what I've since found out is, is that, you know, if you don't master the digital world, meaning you have great videos, great websites, great customer reviews, positive online, everything, then there's a reason why Actually, because of all of that, Sportsman's Warehouse decided to you know give us a call. So, the uh, the persona and the image of your company online is very critical if you want other opportunities to knock and to call you. And Amen. so, um, you know that's uh, that's the second aspect of it. You know, the first is just to recap: direct sales. You have to master the digital world in order to you know uh, drive online sales. But like I said, uh, what I found out later was is that, you know, if your online image is not completely as professional as it could be, you're going to be missing out on opportunities because big box stores are going to look at that and say, well, you know, they're not they don't have a great website. The product doesn't look good. The videos are kind of not so good. They must not be doing good. Therefore, we're not going to call. them. I actually think Sportsman's Warehouse called us because they saw the professional image uh, that we have online. Yeah, your website actually does look nice. I wanted to, I, I should do this more often. I want to ask you who developed it for you, if this 
Revolution Design Group is, your employer, if it's another company that we could link to. And um, essentially, there's only, there are not very many reviews on the homepage. I wonder if you should boost that a little bit. Like the pink camo one says no reviews. Obviously, you right. get some if you've sold it. I think you should get some reviews in there. But uh, you got Robert Herjavec on the page. That's really cool. So, who did the site for you? Yeah, a Revolution Design here in Eugene, Oregon, where I reside and where the company resides, uh, did that for us. Um, he's a guy named Seth over there at um, Revolution Design, and that website's only three months old. And so, yeah, um, it's, it still kind of smells new, right? New, new site yeah, smell. You know, just constant tweaking. Uh, David, my digital Mac marketing manager, is just constantly on that. You know, fixing you know back end link problems, and there's so much more than to a website, as you know, than just the website, the way it looks. There's all the connection and the links and how it ranks on in the SEO categories and all of this stuff. That you know, he's he, he works on that website several hours a day yep. uh, just to uh, get that thing to rank organically as high as we can. It says here, partners with Herjavec Group. What is, for inquiring minds, what, what would you say is the number one value add that Robert's been able to bring? I don't know how often you communicate with him, but he only gave you 60 grand. I mean, for someone who had already sold $300,000 worth of product, it's not a lot of money. What are you getting for your 25%? What's been the most valuable feedback and guidance? You know, the, the money aspect of it wasn't even, um, you know, um, in my consideration, a big part of it. it it's just being connected uh, with the Herjavec Group and um, so much comes with that halo effect uh, uh, revolving around that aspect. So, you know, um, he's a celebrity. In effect, you have the appearance, you know, of an endorsement to a person who just first looks at your product. So that in itself is really big. So his brand, being connected, his brand uh, and, or any of the shark brands is just going to elevate, you know, the, the, um, the status of somebody's product. And so, so in addition to, um, you know, just being connected to his brand, they have opportunities, uh, that come to them, they pass them on to us, um, other sharks, you know, they may want to pool like stores may want to pool different shark tank products and have a display of shark tank products. And so the sharks will talk and they'll, uh, they'll get together and then they'll let me know of opportunities like that. Yeah. And we then, haven't seen a Robert retreat yet. When is that scheduled for? Cause I'm thinking about stocking it, you know, and yeah. maybe sneak jumping over the fence. When's yeah. the Robert retreat? <clears throat> I haven't heard of one yet. I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, but, uh, uh, that would be fun. I, I, uh, he owns an Island, so I'm hoping it's on the Island. Yeah, well, that'd be making it harder for me to jump the fence, but I hope it is too. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Have you, uh, I met Sean Higgins the other day, well, a while back now, Robert's go to guy, his partner. Uh, solid, solid guy. I liked him a lot. I think that said a lot about Robert after I spent some time with Sean. Have you worked with him at all? I have not. I have not even spoken to Sean. Yeah, he's, at all. he's the front line, mostly tech guy. He goes, he does a yeah. lot of the on site stuff for the casinos and government work, but. Um, I did have another question. I remember calling you when we were rescheduling our appointment since we had a little trouble getting together at first. And uh, one of the phone numbers referred to your mortgage business. Do you have a side business you're running? I do. I've owned a mortgage, a small mortgage company for 15 years now. And um, uh, owning that company was integral, integral into where I'm at now with the Gold Rush Nugget Bucket for two reasons. In, uh, in 2012, uh, interest rates had dropped really low. The mortgage company did very well. I was able to take a lot of pre-tax dollars uh, during the course of that year, not pay taxes on it, and use it for the funding of that $192,000 to uh, start a, a Gold Rush Nugget Bucket. And so uh, at the end of that tax year, what I had was a gigantic tax, tax loss for Gold Rush Nugget Bucket that offset the taxes that would have otherwise been owed on that money that I did not pay taxes on to the mortgage company. So that's how I was able to self-fund the startup of the Gold Rush Nugget Bucket was by uh, using pre-tax dollars. And so I uh, jokingly, before Robert came in, I, I, I told everybody that Uncle Sam was my business partner. <laughs> well, they so, are. It's no joke. Um, and then, you of just course, took advantage uh, of it. Exactly. Yeah, it was. You know, I, and that's how going back how I heard about Shark Tank, my CPA had told me about Shark Tank because I was in talking to him just saying, okay, I want to make sure I can do this. You know, can I not pay taxes on this company and then incur a big loss with this new startup and have them offset each other? And he confirmed it. And then he said, by the way, you should go on Shark Tank. So that's just to tie up that old story there. Well, caveat at the end. No, it's true. I mean, the tax code is written for business owners. It's advantageous for people who don't aren't involved in business. It's yep, you know, I, I had to, to becoming wealthy. 
as a small entrepreneur company, I have really zero issues with uh, the, the tax code and um, how well it works for us. It, it's obviously worked very well for me. The one thing that I don't like that I would like to change with the tax code, though, is, is that I can't write off the inventory until I sell it. So you've got to buy it, and then you can't write it off until you deplete it. And so uh, I, I just placed a big order on January 1st so that I have the whole year to deplete it, as opposed to buying it in December, then it's not a write-off at the end of the year. So, Actually, I have, a, I have a manufacturing question. Are you getting the entire product made at one factory and shipped to you? No, the the the, um, the proprietary parts that I had the molds made to make um, are um, – those parts are shot in Vancouver, Washington, and then the buckets and the uh, water pail that's inside it, uh, inside the logo is actually a pail inside that five gallon bucket. Those pails and buckets are made in Sandusky, Ohio. And so, and then the, the lid is made, I think, in somewhere in California. Everything in the States, huh? I would have thought the bucket, the enclosure would have been overseas. Yeah, no, it, uh, you know, on the bottom of it, it says made in the USA. And so um, the bucket's made in the USA. And then all of the parts are shipped here to Eugene, Oregon. And then uh, our warehouse person who assembles them uh, modifies the five gallon bucket, cuts the holes in them. And then we have all of the uh, inventory uh, positioned in an assembly line fashion so that once the bucket is modified, you know, he can just go and put all the pieces together, weigh it for QC purposes, put a sticker on it, and then put it back in the in the, sto- in the storage room for shipping. Awesome. Awesome. But going back to uh, the Western Mortgage Brokers, the, the, the other key piece that why that played such a critical part of this is that because I owned a business for 16 years, and so uh, I didn't have to learn that aspect of it while trying to um, get the nugget bucket sales off the ground. I was literally able just to duplicate um, you know, had the attorneys, had the CPAs, all of that, uh, payroll, you know, I've been doing it for 16 years. So I did not have to learn how to run a business as part of the startup, which is really critical because that's a big, that's a big part of it. And that, and that can suck away a lot of time from an entrepreneur that would Huge. otherwise be going towards marketing. And so um, if I, you know, it'd be a lot harder for me if I had to, you know, learn how to market this and put it together and, and learn the business side of it as well. Yeah, that explains why you're able to generate so much in sales in the first 18 months. Obviously, you had a lot of those pieces already in place. So, yep. And before we go, I want to ask you about the Shark Tank tsunami, the Shark Tank effect, the success yeah. that you had after the airing. I mean, give us an idea of, uh, I don't know what your monthly sales were, if they averaged out or if you had your best sales a couple months leading up to the airing. But over the next weeks, month, three months afterwards, uh, how did things go? Did you see a huge spike? Was it about what you expected or was it disappointing? No, no, it was, uh, it was, um, a tsunami effect for sure. You know, I think we sold, you know, 125 kits in in the first half hour, uh, after the show had aired. And, um, over the course of about four months, I think we had revenue of over $300,000. Solid. Nice after Shark Tank aired. And so, in fact, it just aired uh, on CNBC last night. Um, and so we're dealing with a nice bump in uh, shipments today as a result of that. CNBC's really done a nice thing for Shark Tank entrepreneurs. I hear that some of the re-airings are as quality as the originals, especially for season four and five people because the new fans haven't seen them. Well, and that's part of the Shark Tank effect is the reruns. Um, ABC, so my original episode aired in February of last year. ABC re-ran it primetime in June. CNBC re-ran it um, December 5th or thereabouts, and then again. And so, you know, that's that's a lot of free earned media right there that, uh, you know, that's uh, just part of that Shark Tank effect. So it just keeps on going. Are you going to – I see you have three buckets behind you now. They're the same three I see on your website. Yep. Uh, they have names. I'm just calling them yellow, brown, and, and pink. But it looks like you got the – yeah, complete and camo. Oh, so they're the same. They're just different colors. Yep, they're all exactly the same, just different color. All right. Are you going to be a single product company for the foreseeable future? Or is Robert ex- encouraging you to expand at all? You know, we're uh, I'm focusing on the brand uh, and the and perfecting the, the the single product for right now. But, but that definitely leads into um, bigger and better things. For instance, one thing that we're developing right now it's called uh, the Gold Rush Gold Finder, and it's an app that uh, you'll be able to have on your phone uh, and one of the biggest questions that we have when people are interested in buying our product is, is where can I go? And so uh, we are developing an app that will be uh, an international as well that um, kind of like Wikipedia, people can participate and add locations um, 
and uh, comments about uh, areas and if it's posted gold panning only or no motorized equipment, these kinds of things. And so um, that's actually a, a big um, part of uh, where we're heading uh, next with, with the brand and the product. All right. Well, I'm glad we had a chance to talk, Mark. Really exciting to hear how things are going. Congratulations on working with Robert and you guys are uh, pressing forward. And uh, I just want to know what we should expect to see in the future from the gold rush nugget bucket. Where are you going to be in a year, three years, five years? Uh, the plan is is to um, get into uh, as many big box stores as we can. And I think we've got a great start with that because of the Sportsman's Warehouse uh, um, and Kelly Co. Metal Detectors opportunities that we have uh, going for us now and international um, and the Amazon exclusives. And so um, the Gold Rush Gold Finder app, we're hoping to launch here in the next four or five months. That's in um, beta testing right now, uh, I think is where I last heard of that. So, um, yeah, just bigger and better and moving on. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, best of luck to you. Keep searching for those gold nuggets and hopefully we do a contest or a giveaway or something when this comes out. Cause I think it's such a cool product. I'm sure some viewers would love to get their hands on one. So. Yep. Absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, we just, uh, gave away a whole kit to uh, dude. I want that.com, uh, <laughs> give away products and, uh, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we'd be more happy, more than happy to participate in it. All right, give our best to Robert, and uh, we'll see you on the flip side. Sounds good, PJ. Thanks a lot for having me on. Gold! 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 (laughs) Thank you for jumping in to the Shark Tank Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and head over to sharktankpodcast.net to get the show notes from each episode and join the free Shark Tank Insiders list. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shark Tank Podcast and on Twitter at Shark Tank PDCast.